Hello, everyone. What a wonderful week, right? It's been, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. Um, my name is Anthony Breitbach. I am a professor and the vice dean of the Doisy College of Health Sciences at St. Louis University. And I will serve as the chair uh, for this panel presentation to wrap up um, uh, Altogether Better Health 11. Um, it is my privilege to serve as the chair for this closing panel. As we finish this transformational week and close the 11th Altogether Better Health Conference here in Doha. On behalf of Interprofessional.Global, I express a heartfelt gratitude to everyone here, um, to Qatar University, to the amazing people of Doha, and everyone who's attended this week. It's been, it's been really a, a transformational experience. I would like to invite our panel up. We're using six, we're, we're using six, so yep, there we go. Okay, good, perfect, thank you. Um, and this, uh, so I'd like to invite our panel up, Con up right now, and I'm gonna introduce you once you're here. Thank you. Jill, John, Ala, Mahmoud, Champion. So Jill, can you sit that seat right there? Thank you. Champion, you're in that one right there. Thank you. You're at the end, Mahmoud. Is Allah here? John, you're right there. Thank you. Is Allah here? Okay, well, we're going to get started, and I'm going to introduce our, our panelists. Um, we're going to ask them to reflect on the week um, here at Altogether Better Health and express some feelings about kind of some of the opportunities and challenges we have in our work ahead around interprofessional collaboration. Dr. John Gilbert, founding principal and professor emeritus in the College of Health Disciplines at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Jill Thistlethwaite, uh, adjunct professor, faculty of health, University of Technology, Sydney, New South Wales. Dr. Champion Nioni, associate professor and senior researcher in the School of Nursing in the, at the University of Free State in South Africa. Dr. Ala Elowase, director of clinical operations and engagement in the uh, uh, the Qatar University Health Chair of uh, Interprofessional Education Committee. And by the way, she's been pretty busy this week, so. <laughs> Round of applause for Ala. And Dr. Mahmoud Adil, Ministerial Advisor to Qatar Ministry of Public Health, as well as a clinical professor at Qatar University and the University of Glasgow. So we're gonna start by asking John, Reflect on this week at Altogether Better Health and really where we're headed as far as uh, interprofessional collaboration. Right. Well, I think uh, this week we've crossed from uh, childhood into adolescence. It's been a long time coming and this, uh, this was an enormously important event in the development of the field. Um, and when I look back at the kinds of issues that we've been contending with, all of us, for the last 20 years, it's very clear that we're, we are at this place where we're seeing the kinds of things we should be investigating, um, the ideas we should be moving forward, and then with the contemplation about what does it really mean. So this week, 
been thinking really hard, what does it really mean? Second question I thought was really interesting. I think that having Jim here um, and talking about the role of the WHO was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, apart from all of us being phenomenal, but you know, we've been trying for a long time to get the voice of, the, the global voice of interprofessional education or person-centered collaborative practice on that stage. And I think it, I don't think, I believe now it is on the WHO stage. And that's really important for a global organization. We're not talking about just our individual organization, we're talking about IP.G, you know, this great organization that's been built. And so being on that agenda is, for me, it's really, really important. And so that's, um, I still worry that there's not a true understanding about what interprofessional education is. Um, there's, there's still not an understanding that it's a, it's a way of thinking and it's a way of being. It's not a course on a Friday afternoon in Vancouver when it's raining at 1.30. And there's still too much of that thinking around. It's a course. It's not a course, in my view. It's a way of thinking and it's a way of being. And we've got to get there because all those naysayers that I mentioned in my talk will say, oh, why do we want to go there? We've got to feel it, we've got to think it, we've got to share it that way, and don't put it in yet another course because as sure as heck is heck, it's going to fail. Thanks, that's me. Yeah, thank you. No, yeah, she's got one. Me. So Jill, um, can you talk a little bit about your experience this week and, and maybe react to some of the things John's yeah. talked about? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I mean it's just been an absolutely wonderful week, very tiring very motivational, very aspirational, and I would like to reiterate what John says about interprofessional education and sometimes the confusion that we meet with when we discuss it. Um, and I think that also applies to interprofessional collaborative practice. Um, uh, it's difficult sometimes to see that in action, and I think this is one of our problems, that we have good interprofessional education where it's happening. We could do with more of it, but we have it where it's happening. And we get our students to expect more than they actually see often in practice. Interprofessional collaborative practice is happening, but it's not always obvious. Um, it's not sort of got a banner across it saying we're, we're working in a team. It can be very subtle. Uh, and our students don't always, and, and this happens at the post-certification level, it's not always that obvious, those connections. It doesn't have to be a structured team. It can be a very loose collaboration. So I think we need to uh, advise our students that interprofessional collaboration comes in many guises. It could be better, and we all know um, we all see, and we've all probably experienced as patients, fragmented care, uh, that whole thing of having to tell your story over and over again. Um, the, the person comes along, um, has no idea how you've been managed, uh, you're not listened to, you're, we've heard about lived experience, uh, you're not treated as if you're part of that collaboration often. So we have, we have a long way to go, but I think what we've seen this week is, is the diversity of our community. Um, and I spoke about inclusivity uh, a few days ago, it seems like weeks ago. Um, so we are an inclusive community. We want to get more people into our community. We want to value our diversity. We want to hold the patient and client as the as the point of this, so it's not just about education, it's about care, um, and we're, our, our ultimate aim is to improve the care of the population we serve. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Uh, Champion, so uh, give us your reflections on the week and maybe where interprofessional.global fits in the picture. Uh, thanks, Tony. So I'm going to maybe start by expressing my Gratitude. I think this week was just phenomenal. Um, from the conceptualization to the execution to get us to where we are, I think we are sitting in a space of utmost gratitude and privilege. And this has, I mean, this has been 
a dream come true. So I think that's the first thing that I wanted to just point out. And just to reflect that this conference as an arm of interprofessional.global is, is really interwoven in the thoughts of building capacity, particularly in regions where there is need for bolstering, there is need for presence, and I think we've seen that with ANIC and the formulation of ANIC. So congratulations actually for the formulation of ANIC and actually that happening in the presence of IPG. I, I've also seen that throughout the discussions in the, con in the conference, there are certain challenges that are similar across the regions, and there are certain challenges that are unique across the regions. But being in the conference and being here actually gave us an opportunity to reflect, to really think where are we coming from, why are we having these challenges, and what are the possible solutions. And at this stage, I was so excited to see the Asia Pacific region actually having an opportunity to meet and talk about the strategy for the region. And without this conference, that would not have happened. And I think we could have been one online meeting, another online meeting, and then that would have happened. So for me, that worked very well that we had, in addition to ANIC, another revival of a region of interprofessional.global. So that's, that's an addition to the list of successes that we have seen in this conference. But we still need to think a bit more. How do we attract other parts of the world to be part of this conversation? How do we expand and acknowledge that there are shared challenges and shared struggles across the regions? How do we think about reimagining the inadequacy of resources and working within the resources that we do not have? Thinking about investment in healthcare, how do we reimagine the message that we are sharing? And I think that's one big argument at IPG how do we rethink the conversation that the person who's ready to receive our story understands exactly what we're talking about when we talk about IPE competences? And I think that's a big challenge that we face in our regions and where we're going. So for everybody, I think one question that I got throughout the session is, how does one become a member of IPG? That was the constant story. I, we see IPG, we hear about IPG, but how do I become a member? How do I sign up to be IPG? Just remember that IPG is a confederation of regional networks. So your engagement of, and your membership in IPG is actually coming from the work that you do within your region. So work within your region, identify who are the people within your region, contribute to your region, you are actually contributing to IPG. And this is the conference where we sit and the platform where we meet, where we realize that we can learn from, about, and with each other, and that we are stronger together. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yep. So real quick, number one, we want to express our gratitude to you, Ala. We appreciate it. You've done so much to make this happen. You had a vision quite a long time ago, so thank you so much. We appreciate it. So can you reflect on the week? And, and looking forward to your new established Arab network. Um, think about where um, things might, might be going from there. So talk about it. Um, Microphone. Um, thank you, Tony. Um, like it's been really a great pleasure hosting this conference, um, uh, the 11th edition of the Altogether Better Health uh, Conference in, here in Qatar. And I really would like to thank Professor Asma Al Thani for her immense support. I think. Uh, <laughs> um, Professor Asma, the Vice President for Health and Medical Sciences at Qatar University, has been really inspirational. She wanted this conference to be at a high level. She really wanted people to hear about it. She wanted us to be on the, on the map, on the global map. And I think, you know, um, Professor Asma, um, what she did in terms of trying to get high leaders, you know, having Her Highness Sheikh Hamoza attend the event, having the president of the university, the minister of health attend this conference means a lot. Means a lot to her, means a lot to us, means a lot to our university. And I think as you have witnessed during the um, opening ceremony, having these high officials 
showcase and highlight the importance of health in Qatar, the importance of interprofessional education, and how much the university has invested in this. We started the interprofessional education. I always go back to the committee in 2014, and I know this is not actually the start, but we have started in our health um, sectors in the different health professions since the 1980s, as you've seen within our timeline. So there has been a lot of investment in health, both in education and in practice. And I think it was the right time to have this conference here in Qatar. Um, it was the right time because as I've seen and as I have witnessed within this conference, so many people have this high appetite. You know, they really want to learn about interprofessional education. Um, seeing people, um, especially from the region, they've been doing a lot um, in silos, but now having this network will really unite us in trying to identify things that are common between us and how can we really support um, each other. So I am really optimistic, I'm very optimistic about the establishment of this network. Um, everybody who came from the Arab region, we will be sending an email out for people to sign, um, to sign and we will definitely start the discussion and together and collaboratively, I'm sure it's going to be a strong network, part of the interprofessional.global and part of this uh, global map. I am, you know, seeing the logo of our network is a dream come true. Um, going back to 2014, when uh, we attended the Pittsburgh conference, seeing Hubar, we had, you know, every network had their own uh, meetings, um, if you recall in previous uh, conferences. And then Professor Hubar, he said, come on, let's have a Middle East uh, network. And there were like three, four people who were coming. And, you know, we started discussion and yes, let's do this. And I think we've been passionate about it. We've been committed. Um, uh, and it's not, it wasn't an easy journey. You know, there was obstacles in the way trying to really get everyone to see the benefit and the value of it. But now we're seeing the fruit, we're seeing the success. Um, and I really thank everybody for being part of this conference, for contributing to the global discussion. Um, we've, what I really enjoyed in this conference is like, we don't just have academics, we have practitioners, we have policy makers, um, we have regulators, in addition to our amazing students who are really the future um, health workforce, and I'm sure that our um, f the future is really going to be bright. And I really would like to acknowledge the, all the students who have been part of the organizing team and who have been att who have attended the conference and participated in the different sessions. So, um, Mahmoud. Uh, you actually sp uh, spent um, our partnerships meeting with us uh, before this conference. Um, and I know you have a unique role through the Ministry of Health, uh, of Public Health. Um, give us your perspectives on, on what you've experienced over the past week and where do you think um, uh, all these discussions fit within the healthcare sector? Thank you, Tony. Uh, and very good evening or good afternoon. I think. Uh, my last 30, 35 years of professional life could be divided in two parts. First one is a clinical life. I trained as a pediatrician, then public health medicine. But the last 20 years, my role being the leadership role to achieve effectiveness and efficiency of healthcare systems. So I was medical director for Scotland. That was my prime role. Now I'm here in the Ministry of Public Health. So I see in this conference, I saw things from three vantage points. First, policy and regulatory. Second, academic. And third, third service delivery. And I just realized uh, that actually, if we would really want to make an impact and we want to be an action-oriented, we need to understand the vested interests of those three constituencies because they do have their vested interests. Let me start with, uh, in every country, there is a regulator and a policy maker. In terms of the workforce, their prime responsibility is to forecast, to plan, to recruit, to retain, and then to develop the workforce. So this is their prime response. And then, of course, they need to register, and that's the licensing part. 
we should have a safe healthcare professionals. If you look at from academic viewpoint, uh, we are very keen in any part of the world to have fit for purpose uh, workforce, which is properly trained with the right competencies. And if the third part, the service delivery, that we want that we should deliver high quality service at the minimum cost. Doesn't matter if you're in Canada and America, in the UK and in the Middle East, this is the prime goal. But when I looked at the conference, I just realized another thing. If your first conference, uh, John showed a beautiful picture of Chatham House. My office was very near to Chatham House. And I remember all the wonderful days coming out of Houston train station and passing by. But the first conference happened in 1997. And this is the 11th one. In the last 25, 26 years, the paradigm has shifted. First, from healthcare to health and well being. Uh, from uh, the uh, uh, patient to population. Secondary care to community and social care. And then from uh, the chronic diseases, uh, so acute disease to chronic diseases. So my question to myself and to the audience is, has our IPECP has shifted it? Because when we started in almost 25 years back, that was the state of play. Then interestingly, and I think uh, people are over here who were part of the WHO framework in 2010, they incorporated many of those things, but still we need to move forward. Then the question comes that, which I observed that, do we want to be part of the problem or do we want to be part of the solution? It is how we are going to frame ourselves. So this is the question which I pose to myself and I'm posing to everyone. Because if you look at those three key stakeholder, policymaker, uh, the service delivery organizations and academics, we need to be thinking that how best we can frame it because the framing is the key issue. And I was sitting in your communication group and I am a firm believer of communication because half of our success is based on the communication. And I think we need to work on that so that we can tell the people that we are part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And I'm very happy to expand on it. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, obviously a big event this week was the Winter Third Doha de Declaration, right? Um, does anyone want to kind of uh, chime in on, on where that fits and, and the, how that might guide our work moving forward? John, Jill? Uh, well, I think to have an impact, They control it Excellent. over there. So, you know, we know about it here. Um, it's all about dissemination, uh, advertising, a media presence. Um, we've had, you know, we've been with these declarations before. We've had the Vancouver, we've had the Sydney one. They've gone out there, they've got so far. Um, so I think the, the main thing for this, it's not going to do anything unless people know about it and start discussing it. And even if they're negative, we just need to get that, that presence out there. It's all about presence now, isn't it? Um, in, in the media and, and the footprint. So um, let's, let's all go, every single person here, spread the message, send the link, talk to people, explain it when they ask, and just really get it out there. That sounds like uh, the, one of the co-facilitators of the communication working group has some work to do. <laughs> yes, Tony, I mean, it's all on your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> it will be a team effort. And, so and I, I would also like to say, I think, um, which is slightly off the point maybe, I, I would actually like to see more of a primary care presence. Um, Around the world, we need a strength from primary care. Primary care is all about teamwork. We need the systems, the funding, um, and the education, and we need to ensure our students understand the value of primary care, because I think that's a big problem at the moment. In many countries, uh, our students are turning away um, and I think we need to get that out there. So I think collaborative practice has a home, a major home in primary care, and that's that's where we're going to do the best. Yeah, and actually, but I am biased. Yeah. No, and, and and John, you were actually um, 
part of the group that worked on the, the primary care um, a framework for the WHO that just came out. Yeah. Uh, well, just to respond. Okay. Yeah. Just to respond to Jill. I mean, just think Alma Ati Declaration 1978. We're going to fix primary care. This week, there's going to be another meeting, international meeting on primary health care here in this country. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a huge issue. With respect to the um, declaration, you know, having lived through the Vancouver and the Sydney and this one, huge, huge progress in articulating intention, you know, really, really kind of boiling it down, boiling it down, and getting those words so that they can become more than an intention, they become an action. And what I hope when we get to the next one is that those intentions will have become clear actions. That's our challenge. And, uh, you know, thank heavens for all the good work that was done around that, and I know that people flogged at it, but if we do not fulfill those intentions, we might as well go home again. You know, it's not, it's not going to work. So it's great stuff, and so my response is intention, intention, I work to the intention. And please yeah, please. I mean, that, that's a great segue. So we're talking about action, right? Yeah. Um, we had our interprofessional global partnerships meeting. Um, we have we have deliverables. We have things that we need to deliver on. Um, uh, Champion, what do you think uh, are some things that we can work on as far as the organization? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the the Winter the Door Interprofessional Declaration is a true testimony of togetherness and how we all came together and wrote that work. And <laughs> we are the champions. I just wanted us just to take a moment to just give a round of applause for the hard work that came into that declaration. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara, for leading the team and giving the very insightful keynote about the declaration because that gave a lot of clarity. And I think the big challenge we have, um, in as much as interprofessional that global wants to use it to advocate for policy, it also is a challenge to regions. How do we translate it to our own context? And we do not want, like you're saying, we need practical plans on what really happens in the region. I want to come back and speak in Africa, this is what has happened, this is what we've thought, and this is how we've operationalized it to the ground, because we really want to use it to make a difference and see what we actually want to do. So it will be interesting to see as regions, what we'll be reporting about the declaration two years from now. Yeah, that sounds good. Ala? Yeah, um, I wanted to really emphasize on the communication aspect and the, the importance of spreading the word. I think we are doing a lot of amazing stuff, but unfortunately, it stays amongst the walls. You know, nobody really hears about it. And I know I had, uh, like uh, with uh, Dr. Asma, we had uh, a discussion. She was telling me um, about attending a conference. And they've talked about also the importance of having social media influencers. You know, this is now the, the trend, is having social media influencers. And many people are listening and uh, following them. Um, uh, so she, you know, w one of the discussion points was, it's very important, like when we are doing conferences, a lot of money is invested, a lot of effort is invested, but nobody hears about them except people who are within the actual building. Um, and that's why we were very keen, especially with the opening ceremony, to invite social media influencers to attend and spread the word to the public. And I think this is, I, I would say, we really need to emphasize about spreading out the message. And I urge each one of you in this room, um, you, I'm sure many of you have social media platforms, you know, reflecting, sharing your pearls of wisdom from this conference. Our, the theme of this conference was cultivating a collaborative culture, sharing pearls of wisdom. So I think if each one of you shared these pearls of wisdom on their social media, amongst their you know, different networks, I think this would be really powerful. Um, and make sure you use the hashtag ATPH2023. So, you, because it is a really a powerful tool, anyone who wants to search about what has been said in ATPH conference, just, you know, using hashtag ATPH2023, and then they would read about it, learn about it, without them even attending the conference. And I think public engagement is really important. So I really, really uh, believe in the power of communication. Yeah, and, and to be honest with you, kudos to the people that have been 
live tweeting and posting and I know our interprofessional.global um, traffic on our site, the impressions have gone up like 400% in the last week. So um, kudos to everybody who's doing that. So it does make a difference. It, um, so um, um, Mahmoud, uh, do, you, could, do you have anything to add as far as action steps moving forward? I think I'm sitting very near to the portal of wisdom. So a lot of things being <laughs> through osmosis here. Uh, okay, I think uh, I feel we need to be innovative. And what innovation is, it is a systematic uh, practice of developing and marketing uh, breakthrough solutions to be adopted by the customer. So this is one of the definitions. Who are our customer? These are the uh, public, patient, policy makers, uh, professionals, mm -hmm. and press and media. So five P I, I will always remember, you can understand I've been part of the civil service in UK. So, the question is, uh, we do excellent things. I mean, uh, after listening to Champion and after being part and parcel of many things, which is Interprofession Global is doing, are we able to market our solution? This is the first question. And do we understand the problem? Because for any innovation, we need to have three things, right? Uh, first, we need to have a problem, we need to have a solution, and we need to have a business model to implement the solution. So what is happening, and most of the time, that we are pretty good in the first or second, but we don't know what business model we need to adopt. Let me give you two examples. I started with policymakers, right? Uh, I always said, we are developing in the, in Qatar, we are developing the National Health Strategy 3, which is from 2023 to 2030. So it is a big step. And the workforce is part and parcel of it. And what I'm saying, the policy innovation, which of course I sit over there on the board, and I said to them, rather than you look at the workforce capacity and capability, you, we, need to, uh, we need to introduce the word effective workforce. If we go with the effective workforce, then it means that we need to have interprofessional mm -hmm. collaboration because the goal is the outcome. Goal is not how many doctors we need, how many mm -hmm. nurses we need. How so. Then the goal comes, the service, for example. 17% of the people in Qatar have got diabetes. I always say that for service delivery, for interprofessional collaboration, we need to pick up some tracer conditions for innovation. If you pick up diabetes, I can give you one example. In year 2000, uh, uh, the Department of Health England was keen to develop the Diabetes National Service Framework. At that point in time, 50% of our patients were seen in the secondary care and 50% were seen in, in the primary care. Fast forward, 2023, we developed it. The balance has shifted. What has shifted? 80-20. 80% of our diabetic patients in UK are seen in the primary care, 20% in secondary care. And within primary care, 80-20. 80% are seen by the specialist nurses, and 20% by the GP doctor. Right, now, NICE, National Institute for Clinical Excellence, who developed the guidelines, they use the word clinical guidelines, and I challenged them. I said, when you use the word clinical guideline, you are excluding many professions who are not clinicians, but they play a pivotal role in dealing with diabetes. So if you look at the NICE guidance, it's no more clinical guidance, it is health guidance. So it means that if you look at the nutritionists, if you look at the communi um, community workers, they are the pivotal. For example, we realize that there is a high prevalence of diabetes in UK among the Asian population. Community workers play the pivotal role to bring those uh, people on board. So I think we need to be thinking about innovation. And I think last but not least, uh, while we are very energetic and I talked about three constituencies, I think one thing I learned, we need to have think tank. Do we want to make ANIC a think tank or the interprofessional global is a think tank? But I think we need to have think tank to, under, to develop the innovative solutions. And I think we need to shift our thinking in the way that we need to, for example, in UK, we have got King's Fund, we have mm -hmm. got Nuffield Institute, and maybe in America, Brooklyn Institute, in Canada, wonderful institute. But what about interprofessional collaboration? Can we move into the think tank approach? Thank you. Well, that's, uh, those are excellent points. So um, do we have any um, questions or comments from the audience at all? 
Do we have anyone that wants to ask a question, make a comment? Right here? Do we have a microphone or not? We got one? Take one of these. I got it. Yeah. Um, actually, it's not a question, it's just a quick comment. So when we are talking about social media and social media existence, I realize that uh, inter interprofessional or global, it's not really existing on normal social media. It is on LinkedIn, maybe on Twitter. It's not on Instagram and Twitter, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And if we want I've, this I've, to reach the young generation that's going to go into the work field in a couple of years, then not only the influencer should be tweeting and talking about it, interprofessional global should be talking about itself for it to reach everyone and not become excluded. And that's, that's really, to be honest with you, we've grown quite a bit. So up till last May, we only had Twitter. And so we have, we're actually engaging in a, um, we're working with a, a, in a digital marketing strategy. And part of that is we are exploring other social medias. We're also looking at um, creating more accessible media, um, looking at multiple languages, looking at multiple platforms, different types of uh, dissemination strategies. So, but thank you, those are great points. If, Okay, okay, that's, that, we, you better be careful. We might take you up on that offer, so thank you. Um, okay, great, thank you very much. Here, question? Comment? Okay. I didn't hear Just talk, they'll, they'll get it. Wait one second, wait one second. Is this microphone on? There we go. Try it. Okay. No. Yep. Thank you. Um, I was just saying that I really enjoyed this conference. I am a mental health professional, and um, I'm very passionate about mental health and challenging the stigma associated with receiving mental health services. Um, I'm from New York in the U.S., and I work primar primarily with ethnic minority groups and the role that racism, discrimination, and oppression have on mental health. And as mental health practitioners, sometimes when we're talking about health care, we feel like we're on the sideline like we're not always included in the conversation. So that would be something to just throw out there, ways in which mental health practitioners can be included in healthcare, because our physical health is very much impacted by our mental health and our emotional health. So just for medical health, um, medical health professionals, mental health professionals, I'm sorry, to be part of that conversation as well. Those are great points, and that is absolutely the intention moving forward, for sure. Um, any other questions, comments? Zero minutes remaining. One last question. There we go. Thank you very much. Actually, my comment is about the cases that we attended generally. We have a patient, we have, you know, that we, what we saw by the students. The patient came and he listened to five or more healthcare, medical, physical, whatever, but nobody provided the patient with some content in hand. Like a patient will come sick and you, I think you need x-ray, I think you need, but nothing, how will memorize all of this? Why not, like what you didn't include uh, to provide the, the patient with some content from NHS, National Health Services, or Midline Plus, in different languages. Maybe this also will can look at them because you said the patient came after one month. We should educate our patient more to reduce, uh, for better understanding about his health. It's a comment, maybe not accepted, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think we're out of time, right? So uh, I'd like to thank our panel, John, Jill, Champion, Ala, Mahmoud, thank you very much. We'd also like to, like to thank uh, Qatar University on behalf of interprofessional.global, you've been, you've been wonderful, it's been a great week, so you can go. There we go. You wanna say something? I'm going in 10 minutes, so I just want to say thank you, goodbye, I hope to see you again, safe travels to everybody, and go out and spread the message. Thank you, Jill, appreciate it. I'll take him. Where do we go from here? <laughs> you want to keep one or not?